So let me pray for us. Jesus, thanks for today. Ask your blessing on our evening as we uh, think about the story of your people and how you help them through times of trouble. How uh, so many people were close to death, but then you showed up and changed the trajectory of their lives. Um, we are grateful, Lord, uh, to be with you and with one another as we head towards uh, Good Friday and Monday, Thursday, and and the cross. So, um, and then the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. So, Lord, be with us, uh, guide our conversation, and uh, yeah, thank you for today. We pray this all in G Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, welcome back, and I will begin. And we are going to be talking about Joseph's life, and we're going to see the resurrection theme all throughout his life. So let me figure out how to start sharing my screen and we will begin. All right. So I'm gonna go into, here we go. All right, so I thought I'd have a little fun and say, you know, Joseph had a bio, what, what does his whole life look like? And I put it down a few things, daddy's favorite child dreamer he was the assistant for leah rachel and the servants bilhah and zilpah oh he was a teen left for dead and abandoned well by hateful half brothers he was a slave boy traded to traveling ishmaelites that were headed to egypt he was a slave boy traded to the egyptians he became second in command of potiphar's house there was alleged misconduct with Pharaoh's wife. So he's locked up in prison, forgotten, his character and integrity maligned. Then he became second in command of the prisoners. He's known as the dream interpreter. Then he becomes Pharaoh's vizier, given honor and respect again for interpreting Pharaoh's dream. He becomes the protector of Egypt. He protects his family from famine and all of Egypt. He tests his brother's integrity multiple times. And at the end, we see him as the forgiver and restorer of life. And that all happens from Genesis 37 to 50. So we are talking about 13 chapters in the Bible. This is a big story. And where does the Bible overlap with Egyptian dynasties? Well, I've been steeped in Egyptian history with my girls for the last three months, loving every bit of it, probably more than they are, but I love to see where all of this lines up. And you know, the old kingdom begins with all the pyramids being built, which is amazing. And then we have the first intermediate period with dynasties seven through 11, and there's a lot of civil war. The rich grow richer, the poor grow poorer, and famine and drought make things worse. And this is where we have Abraham journeying to Egypt for food to escape starvation on his journey. And he almost loses his wife in the process because Pharaoh thinks, well, he was told a little white lie and said he was his sister when it was really only his half sister and he was afraid of Pharaoh. And, you know, he got him, got his wife back and was blessed with lots of things to go on his journey. But that was the first intermediate period. Then we have the Middle Kingdom in Egypt. This is the 12th dynasty. There's a lot of peace and unification, and there's a lot of irrigation projects and trade and culture and fine hieroglyphics. It was a wonderful time, and there was more control uh, as a uh, Son Wostret III gained more control as a leader. And then we come to the second intermediate period, 2040 through 1782 BC. We have a lot of dynasties happening here, dynasties 13 through 17, and this is partly because of weak rulers. And during this time, Joseph is sold as a slave. And in Egypt, smaller areas were ruled by the local princes. So there's a lack of unification, and this is where our story is set. And if you want to look one step ahead, after Joseph's story, we have the early New Kingdom with the 18th dynasty. The Hyksos invade Egypt for like 150 years, and pretty soon they, the Egyptians overthrow the Hyksos, but then because of, for whatever reasons, they become the enslavers and they become the oppressors to the other nations around them, including the Israelites, and that's where we find the story of Moses. So Joseph was sandwiched in between Abraham and Moses. 
All right. Well, this story starts with Genesis 37, two through four says, now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Well, colorful robes meant a lot in that time. They were worn by royalty. They were a status symbol of wealth and honor. They were definitely not worn by common people and certainly not by the youngest. So what is their father doing? And their father is causing quite a little bit of trouble here in the family. Joseph's half brothers respond with envy. And we know the envy arouses anger because of someone else having something better or achieving something that they think they don't deserve or that the other person deserves instead of them. So in this story, let me just go back and say, in the first sentence, we say, now Jacob dwelt. And then in the third sentence, it says, now Israel loved Joseph. So then I have to ask the question, is it Jacob or Israel? Well, Jacob is Joseph's father's name used in patriarchal time, but Israel is also Joseph's father's name used in the tribal time. Same person, and all 12 tribes are named by Jacob or Israel in Genesis 47. But Joseph's story is caught between these two eras of history, in the, between the patriarchal and the tribal time where these 12 tribes of Israel um, begin to be named and um, organized. So. so we have these 12 sons of Jacob. And just to give a little background about where Joseph's growing up, he's growing up in a household that uh, is not perfect. And we should look at his father first and see this trend of, of strife. Jacob means deceiver and Jacob deceived his father into giving him the birthright instead of his twin brother Esau, who is seconds older than him. And then next, we see that Jacob is deceived by his father-in-law Laban, who gives him his first daughter Leah after the seven years of labor and makes him work another seven years for Rachel, whom he loved. Now Jacob has 12 sons, but six are from Leah. So we have Reuben, Judah, Simeon, Zebulun, Levi, and Issachar. And then two are from Rachel, the oldest, Joseph, and then Benjamin. And then I wrote down the order in case you're interested of the eldest to youngest. You can see Joseph and Benjamin are the youngest children here. And at the time in which this stripe is happening, the oldest is probably in their 30s. Uh, you know, and then some of the others are in their 20s still, but Joseph's still a teenager. Benjamin's a child. And then in the story, we find that Jacob's own sons deceive Jacob. So this is kind of a messed up family, right? And yet God is fulfilling his promise to Abraham. By the time we get to Jacob, there are already 70 family members in Abraham's descendants. And so God continues to prosper Abraham's descendants as promised. And we will see this with Joseph. And Genesis 39 says, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. So what happens? Joseph gets a beautiful coat. His brothers already hate him. But then let's add a little more drama. He's having dreams and he's telling his family these dreams. And these dreams are about people bowing down to him and serving him. And his family hears these dreams and it's a call to serve Joseph, but they refuse to heed this call. Joseph's dreams are making his older brothers look inferior to him, which is making them furious, of course. And Joseph's brothers are arrogant, which is why they become angry when Joseph's dreams make them look inferior. Joseph's father even rebukes Joseph for this arrogance, right? However, it isn't arrogance if it's a true dream from God to reveal God's purpose through Joseph. Instead, it shows the arrogance of the other family members because they cannot see or even imagine their younger brother being more successful, having more power, or ruling over them. And that drives them to plot his death. And so we're going to look at one artist who drew this beautiful painting on alabaster, 
And I had to look that up to say, what is exactly alabaster? But it's kind of a rock. And this painting, I'm sure it would be beautiful to see actually on this stone because the artist uses the stone's contour to shape the landscape around it. So this artist is Antonio Tempesta. His nickname was Il Tempestino. And um, when I go to that slide, um, you're free to, to point things out. But here in this story that we're going to see, uh, Joseph is recounting to his 11 brothers this dream in which the sun, moon, and 11 stars are bowing down to him. And the heavenly, heavenly bodies in that time were very important as prophetic symbols of of the power that he would end up having. And so Joseph's gesture in this artwork is pointing to the sun. All right, let's take a look at that now. And I, there's one other note here that says that the, um, the rolling landscape is just uh, worked with the veining of the alabaster. And so I will show you this, go full screen. I don't know what. See the camels? Wow. Yeah. Did they, uh, <clears throat> I need to ask, did, did they have domesticated dogs back then? <laughs> I doubt it, but I didn't research that. I don't, where is the dog? I see camels and horses. And I see goats and sheep. Where's the dog? He, he's just to the left of everybody. It's funny because um, I've actually read that they did not have domesticated dogs at that time. But if you go to the Uffizi in Florence, as you walk up the main steps, there are two dogs carved out of marble and they flank the steps as you're going up the stairs and they're really tender and their heads are turned and they were carved for a roman ruler's home and i've never seen a cuter more domesticated dog in my whole life so i'm gonna say that there were domesticated dogs back then <laughs> all right i know i know it's roman and i know it's further ahead but i'm just saying like it, it is kind of interesting <laughs> the other thing is that, that he is are you helping? No, you're not helping at all. Um, he's not pictured wearing his cloak. It, you know, it seems like a lot of people picture him wearing that cloak, mm -hmm. um, but he's not. Um, ah! That's interesting. Yep. All right. So let's go on in our story. It's so cool that it was painted on an alabaster. I've never seen it before in my life. It's really neat. So Joseph's father sends Joseph out to see his brothers. And it says in thir chapter 37, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. And then he sends them off to Valley of Hebron. Well, Joseph gets there and then finds a man but not his brothers, who says, oh, your brothers moved on to Dothan. So the brothers see Joseph coming from a distance and they're already plotting to kill him. They're like, this is a good time now. Here comes that dreamer, let's kill him. And they say, let's throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Let's see then what will come of his dreams. Well, Reuben hears this and, and tries to rescue the situation and suggests, um, throwing him into a cistern, but not killing him first. Just, just let him stay in there and die. So they're like, okay, sure. And they strip him of his robe, it says that, and they throw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, we know that. And then the brothers sit down for a nice meal. And 
they see a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead on their way to Egypt with spices. So Judah says, hey, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. They think this is a little bit more humane, and the brothers agree. So I had fun with this one. I thought, title of this picture, A Well-Planned Conspiracy. And it's like these brothers are you know, working their plan out in real time and they don't have much time because Joseph is coming. So <laughs> this was not probably not well thought out, but they're like, let's kill him. No, let's throw him in a well to die. Uh, let's, you know, let's sell him for pieces of silver. No, let's, let's take his robe, make sure we have his robe and, you know, make it look like a wild animal ate him. And so we have to pause here and say, does that sound familiar? Matthew 26, 14 says, then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? And so they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And so you're going to see this theme of the trading for silver and the robe, the robe and the derobing um, in this story. And we also want to talk about Dothan because it was called the city of wells or pits. It was 12 miles north of Samaria in the hills of Gilboa. And Dothan means two wells. Both are still in existence. It's also mentioned in 2 Kings, where God did a miracle for Elisha and blinded an entire army's eyes that were coming to slaughter Israel. And it was interesting because they were able to round the Arameans up. They treated them, they were treated kindly by Israel's king. And then they were just let go to return home. So they ceased raiding Israel. So it was really a, a peaceful encounter. And in both instances, both in Joseph's instance and in Elisha's instance, God's promised nation was totally looking threatened, like it's over, it's dead. But God is bigger than the biggest pit or the biggest army. And before we look at three different painters' depictions of the event at Dothan, where Joseph is thrown into the well, I want to just show you what that well looked like. And there was a nice little video just for like one minute where we can see this. Um. Go to the very end here. And you're going to need to share your screen. Oh, it's not sharing? Nope. Interesting that it would stop like that. All right, well, let me know if those things happen. Um, Do you see it? We'll go ahead and try that again. I think if I can't get this full screen, it might not be worth seeing. Yeah, it went full screen the first time, but not now. Okay, I think there's something interacting with the Zoom that's not allowing it to go full screen anymore. So if we're still seeing the screen, we're gonna go back to, we're gonna start looking at our next artwork pieces. The first one, is called The Sale of Joseph by His Brothers by Peter von Cornelius, German and a realist painter. And he was part of the Nazarene movement that desired to revive the biblical and spiritual themes in artwork. And this influenced the Pre-Raphaelite movement, which was more of an effort to move towards maximum realism. And he was an influencing painter um, for Ford Madox Brown, whom we'll meet in another painting. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one.
Kevin, did you want to talk about this at all? Um, yeah, um, I think, I think it's capturing, I, I, I suppose all my observations are kind of like obvious and redundant. Um, it's just a sad piece. It's a hard piece. Um, and fittingly for like a difficult subject and just with the, you know, wherever artists want to draw attention, they place the highest contrast. Mm -hmm. and so the color white, you know, also symbolizing innocence and the, the robe having been torn off. Um, it's also the moment where the darkest darks and the lightest lights meet. And so we just go right there and down to like the, the innocence, even like the color of his skin. He's just, he's really young. He hasn't seen much sunlight. You know what I mean? He's, he hasn't been out working in the fields. So there's so much that like, we're just drawn to in terms of his, it's just, I, I, I don't know. It's a yeah. well, well painted scene of betrayal and, and innocence violated. So, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. All right. Good. And then we're going to take a look at the next one, which before I do, I want to highlight one thing. And that is that Joseph was traded for 20 pieces of silver and a band of Ishmaelites are on their way to Egypt. And that's really significant because the Ishmaelites buy Joseph probably to make a profit in Egypt. So it's very likely that Joseph was literally sold for 30 pieces of silver in Egypt, just like Jesus was. We don't know. But the Ishmaelites themselves are descendants of Abraham's son Ishmael, but they're not the son of promise. The promised descendant Joseph in this moment becomes a slave to the non-promised descendant Abraham, which seems so backwards. Like, why is this happening? And yet still everything that Joseph does brings prosperity because God does have a plan in all of this. Um, and I think throughout Joseph's entire life, we have this example that Joseph was could always be trusted with little. And so God continued to give him more and that echoes what's spoken in Luke 16, that whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. And Jesus was in the hands of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were so arrogant and thought they had all the religious answers, kind of like Joseph's brothers. And Jesus was sentenced to death, just like Joseph's brothers did to Jesus. So we see that echoing. Our next Artwork is by, is one of my favorites, by Flavistin, and he's Russian and romantic composer, a uh, romantic painter. And the title of this artwork is Jacob's Children Sell Their Brother Joseph. He did receive a medal for this. And the question that I posed to you is this painting is foreshadowing something, and do you see it? So let's go look at that one. Kevin, what are your thoughts on this painting? Yeah, um, it's 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 interesting because um, just as you were saying about the foreshadowing um, and the language that they the body language that they use for Joseph is the exact same body language that they would use um, for the descent from the cross, um, oftentimes in different paintings. So when Jesus's body was lowered. Um, Rembrandt used it, Masaccio used it. Um, actually, I, you know, I might have the wrong artist here, but um, again and again, we see the German artists um, using this, but um, it's the figure of Christ being lowered. Um, yeah, and so it's, it, it is, it's, it's, it's a well done, well done painting um, for the typology. Mm -hmm. And then even like the whole idea of like casting lots for his clothing, like it, it almost like on the left-hand side, it almost seems like there are elements of that where they're 
casting lots. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Um, yeah, and the well looks like a grave, you know? Well looks like a grave, yeah. 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 And even, even the figure behind the guys on the left looks like Judas, mm. uh, as you are, you know, as I've seen him portrayed in a lot of different paintings. He, you know, kind of shifty in the dark, mm. kind of his face half hidden. Yeah. I like the, uh, that moment uh, where the guy, um, all the way to the left, his beard is silhouetted against the bright burst of light on the cloak behind him. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes I have very superficial aesthetic observations that just looks really cool. That moment, <laughs> the light like literally looks like it's like shining off the canvas and the way he's silhouetted. Um, I don't know. It's just really well done. Mm -hmm. So you would say then that there's kind of two focal points in this, in this painting, right? Yeah. And it, th that's interesting because one of the general rules of um, composition is you never, ever have symmetry. Um, and so rules exist to be broken. And so, but if you draw a line right down the middle, it almost goes through, you know, the fellow holding the spear, it almost goes right through his nose. Um, yeah, so you, you very much have two points of focus. Um, there's oftentimes there's the triangle, um, not all the time, but oftentimes there's no... You could you could fight for it and say oh there is a triangular composition but not really this is like a bipolar composition very much like north pole south pole um and that's that's unusual but it's it's well done because it tells two stories okay or the, the two sides of the story yeah yeah Our next one that we're going to go to is a modern artist, Yoram Rahman, and he's from Israel. And his title is Joseph's Brothers Throw Him Into the Pit. And this is what he's, this is what is stated about his painting that we're going to look at. So this is a quote, the pit into which Joseph was flung is a symbol of hatred and exile and also of miracles and triumph. The somber palette reflects the darkness of this episode while the tinges of golden and blue light point to a spiritual future where Joseph would rise to power from this foreboding hole in the ground. And the paint in the pit looks like an endless whirlpool reaching deep into the belly of the earth. All right, we're gonna take a look at that next. This is When I look at this, I do see the swirls of color, but that that center swirl just looks scary, like the earth just opened up and swallowed something, someone. It looks like there's a journey. I see the this sort of pathway through the sky that looks like you know the long journey that was taken to get to this place. And then all of these things around it to me kind of reflect the people in Joseph's life and sort of this mocking, like looking in and not caring. Um, what do you think, Kevin? Yeah. I mean, boy, like I wish I could paint like this. Um, it feels like a dream. Um, it feels like a vision. It's extremely well done. I mean, where those are imposing, th those are figures that, they have life and yet they're they're walls they're impenetrable and yeah like that deep chasm opening up in the middle um i i personally like um i like the surrealists um but sometimes like salvador dali kind of feels like um to me it almost feels like a little bit like disney animation like illustrated I, i've never been to taken by Dali, although I like the movement in general. And then I love this piece because it's immaterial. Like everything's not defined in the way that a dream or a vision might be. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, like the, the, the journey, um, 
going off into the into the horizon or maybe it's coming towards us like it doesn't really matter it's just it's an ex i don't know i think this is a brilliant painting i really really like it um captures the horror it does it looks like a nightmare <laughs> i i love my brothers I, i'm very close i have two brothers um and the thought of them turning on me would be the greatest horror i would have in my life it would look something like this. I could I could not handle it if my brothers turned on me, and that's what this painting depicts so yeah. so well. Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. We're gonna see this artist again later later yeah. on. So I'm glad you like it. Okay. I have to say, just just from just to be the philistine, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you were gonna ask me what that painting was about, without giving me you know without somebody telling me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I would have guessed that that was what it was about. So. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. So, yep. All right. On his website, it does say that about the artist that he uses light, the, uh, the light, the air, the spirit of the people in the land in Israel ener energize and inspire him. And it's a modern Jewish expressionism that he uses and his abstracts and in biblical and Judaic artwork. But back to telling the father about the colorful coat. We're going to take a look at two painters who depict this deceitful act of the brothers telling his father that Joseph's misfortunes with a wild animal is why we have this bloody coat of many colors. And the first one will be Christopher Ecclesburg, Eckersburg, Neoclassicism. And then after that, Ford Madox Brown, and who's known for somber, somber colors and dramatic moralistic paintings. So let's take a look at those next. Just a little, maybe I should preface the first one with a little bit about Christoph, Christopher Eckersburg. He's Danish. And um, the drawings, they draw from Greco-Roman antiquities. So you're going to see a lot of that in neoclassicism, all right? The medium is oil on canvas. And this work is thought to even foreshadow the artist's later involvement with the civil rights in Danish Jewish communities. All right, let's look at that one. It's very simple. There's not a lot of people in here. They could have packed the house with all the brothers, but they don't. And so we just have this kind of representation of character. And there's a lot of uh, very obvious lines and geometry in this painting. Yeah, I just just on a technical um, thing, I, I like the the lines in the brickwork more than I like <laughs> more than I like the people's faces. Yeah, um, yeah. There's interesting a lot of redness, the cheeks, um, maybe showing kind of just this shock, hatred, uh, upsetness, all that that matches the blood stain of the garment. The garment also doesn't really look to me like it's a robe of many colors. So I don't know how authentic that really is to the text. But again, um, maybe that's for the purpose of using symbolism with the light and the whiteness. So um, do you mind me? Uh, <laughs> so no, you can, you can be critical if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things that happened um, when the northern artists, um, so whether it was the Netherlands, whether it was the German artists, um, when they wanted to, well, when they wanted to become painters, um, they would go south and they would study. And so uh, they would go down, they would see Velasquez's works. Um, you know, primarily, primarily they went to Rome. Mm -hmm. But um, what they would do is they would do studies after these masterworks and then 
they would they would almost um have like like cut and pastes where they would draw from the masterworks and then they would just plop plop them right in so if you see the head of the fellow holding the cloak so check out i don't know if you can see right there um do you want me to stop sharing so you can let me see i don't think it's this fellow right here i'm trying to get close enough but you see that head of the yeah. guy the fellow who's surprised yeah and then if you go back to the head of the of the man holding the coat um they're nearly duplicates of each other but um you would see wow. this sometimes and w like it's it's kind of like da vinci would rail against this um in his writings where he said the great artist is the one who has nature as his mistress um the artists that kind of sink into um i i forget his specific word choice but they they lose touch with the narrative theme are the mm -hmm. ones who imitate the artists who come before him so neoclassical art at its best it was i mean it was, yeah. it was amazing but that's at its worst sometimes it didn't tell the story as well as yeah. um i don't know like Norman Rockwell. <laughs> it sounds funny to bring him up. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> he went straight to the source, and he had people in his studio, and he had people pose for one hundred percent of his work. Um, he used photographic references, but it didn't matter. But it brought to it an authenticity of storytelling. But then, when they would rely on the works that came before them, sometimes there's something a little bit wooden. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, you can see these two men look like hunters. Yeah. And so you see that. You also see the realism and that these bodies, they're not perfect. Like they really were just trying to say, hey, you know, humans have flaws. <laughs> so you see that. Yeah, a little bit. Yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. And I, I would have thought, I mean, it's for me that I would have, their, their, their age gap does, doesn't look from, the, from Jacob down to the kids. Yeah, I thought the same. Look, yeah, okay, good. Yeah. I think there is a lack of authenticity of the text itself, sure, in that neoclassicism painting. And then the next one is Ford Maddox Brown. And this one is watercolor. And this one I really found fascinating. So we see this, the faces and the expressions, very interesting here. So go right there. And there's the dog, of course, posing. <laughs> well, he's, he's sniffing the blood to see whose it is. <laughs> yeah. He, but he can't tell who's it. You know, he can't tell Jacob that's not the right <laughs> In this painting, um, you see the, the youngest brother, Benjamin, playing this liar. And he looks at the brothers like he doesn't believe a word they're saying. And I find that really well painted in that expression it's interesting you say that because the the guy that's holding the coat looks like he's trying to figure out if if jacob's buying it or not yeah it's yeah, true too wow yeah yeah I, and like one of the things like i i guess like i i i myself i'm always drawn to the thing like tolstoy has an interesting book and it's called uh, what is art it's a short book it's really worth reading um, but one of the things Tolstoy returns to over and over again is the sincerity of the statement. And it's something that I'm drawn to where more or less, like he would say, like, if you're going to paint a painting, did you, did you, and it's referencing like an event, did you read the event? Do you understand the significance of it? Do you, do you care?
actively renting his clothes too. Like the, he's going to tear yeah. his clothes up. Yeah, and there's and yet he didn't even paint his eyes like so much. Mm -hmm. Like it's a really the body language is awesome. The one thing with the painting that uh stumps me is those two feet in the upper corner. Somebody's yeah, like, I saw. I was just looking at those, going, "What? What's that all about?" <laughs> Maybe it's like right in the middle of a common day. Um, <laughs> but uh, eating fruit or something. I, I yeah, it's weird. I, I wonder if it has anything to do with the Jacob remembering a dream of the stairway to heaven and realizing he's just lost his son hmm. because he had that dream where the angels were coming up and coming down this ladder. Just a thought, but yeah. All right. So, Now we get to talk about how the resurrection theme is nestled within this garment motif that we see in the story. And we have to go back and start from the beginning because Adam and Eve found fig leaves to cover themselves in their disgrace, but God didn't find that sufficient clothing and killed an animal for clothing to cover their sins. And now in our story today, Joseph's brothers were envious of Joseph's royal clothing and Joseph's robes are torn and stripped from him. Joseph goes down into the depths of the earth to die. In Jesus's robes, we learn in the New Testament, were also torn, sold for pieces of silver, and Jesus was sentenced to die. So we see that Joseph is a type of Jesus and showing the resurrection story. Joseph was given honor and trusted um, in Pharaoh's household. And the next thing that we're going to learn about is that he passes a test of temptation with Potiphar's wife but his name gets slandered and he'll again go down into the depths to become a prisoner to die. And they didn't treat their prisoners very well. There were no bathrooms and the stench and the disease was so bad that most people didn't survive it. And only family members or people that knew the prisoners would come and feed the prisoners. So he was really, they were really at the mercy of anyone on the outside to bring them food. Um, we also see that, in Jesus's last week, in, he was given praise and glory just a week before the crowds declare, you know, declaring his name wonderful. And then a week later, Jesus's name is slandered, mocked, he's abused. Those robes are taken away. He's abused and treated like a lamb going to the slaughter. And then we see that Joseph's honor is restored when he interprets the dream of Pharaoh and he saves, saves Egyptians from famine. He becomes second commander to Pharaoh. And then Joseph is again given those wealthy clothes of honor. And this foreshadows Jesus' rising from the grave, seeing his disciples and later being taken away to his heavenly father in glory. So we see over and over again, Joseph dying, Joseph rising. And this, I, this motif is nestled within the garments. But there's more about garments that we know from Leviticus 16. And the high priest had to wear garments. But on the Day of Atonement, when they would enter the tabernacle, they could their garments weren't even clean enough. They'd have to strip it all and then take a bath and put on some really special holy linen garment, garments when entering the holy place. And then they couldn't just leave with those holy garments. They had to remove them also and leave them in the tabernacle before they left. And so all throughout scripture, we just see the importance of garments. The garments motif throughout scripture points us to the resurrection. And Isaiah 64, 6 says, for all of us have become like one who's unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So that's bad news. <laughs> the good news we see in Colossians 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And forgive as the Lord forgave you. And, and as members of one body, you're called to peace and be thankful. And it just gives this admonition for what it means to be clothed holy in Christ, the garments of Christ. The garments of righteousness. What does that mean as we walk in that as Christians? And Paul's message here to believers is just beautiful 
And it reminds us that we are wearing the clothes of righteousness that are from Christ. All right. Well, let's go to more. Keep going in and out, but one more. More garment motifs. Potiphar's wife tempts Joseph. And so um, really quickly, I'll just read the scripture because honestly, the scripture storytelling is so amazing. Nobody could write it better. <laughs> One day he went into the house to attend to his duties and none of the household servants were inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her household servants. Look, this Hebrew has been brought to make us a sport of us. He comes in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard my scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. And of course, Potiphar is going to be furious and punish Joseph. And he goes back into that deep, dark pit where he thought he had escaped once and for all. And oh, before we go to the next image, Joseph is tempted here like a new Adam. So Adam and Eve were tempted in the garden, failed. Abraham was tempted with impatience for a child with Hagar, and so he failed. But here, Joseph is tempted by Potiphar's wife and passes the test. He does the right thing, but that doesn't mean he gets any praise for it. And negative consequences follow. Yet the Lord is with him, and he shows him kindness, granting him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. And the Lord gave him success, whatever he did. So let's take a look at a few painters who did uh, this portrayal. And there's actually a lot of them, you know, anything that's sensual and allows for artists to draw the body, right? But um, these are two that I picked out. Joseph and the wife of Potiphar, this medium is a drawing. And Julius von Karelsfeld was also of the Nazarene Brotherhood group movement. And he was reviving the Florid Renaissance style and religious artwork. Look at that next. What captured my eye about this rendering is the movement and the action. It's nice to have the pyramid in the background. <laughs> you know where you are, right? All I'm saying is that with a girl with triceps that big, I don't know if it'd be that easy to run away. I could see how she could rip his cloak off. <laughs> she can bench 225 for sure. <laughs> oh, it's funny. No, but... um. Her face is like even like her her figure, the serpentine figure. It, it is really alluring. Um, but like to give credit to the artist, like you said, uh, Jamie. Sometimes it's just an opportunity to relish in like salacious kind of skin. You know what I mean? But that's not what this artist like fell into. Um, it really is how noble he is with like his hand raised and the other like pushing away. Um, but I think. The use of light, it, it's really well done because his face is cast into shadow as he's turning away from this, mm. which is kind of like shadow is everything in in early art. In early, I mean, like when, before art moved away from naturalism and representationalism, um, shadow meant it was foreboding. Um, you were you had something in front of you that was dark and ominous. Yeah. And, that he is choosing righteousness and yet his face is cast in shadow. It makes me think, um, you know, a man of sorrow is acquainted with grief. And uh, I love a Mark Twain quote. He says, uh, be good, dash, and you will be alone. <laughs> oh, wow. Hmm. And so uh, that that's just extremely, extremely well done. And it's upsetting. Um, his hair almost looks like flames like coming off of his head. You know what I mean? Mm hmm um there's just something there's like a nobility um and i think he somehow for, for me and looking at it um 
Joseph is one of the few figures that, you know, the Bible doesn't really have the Bathsheba story for, or it doesn't have like the, you know, the fall from grace or when God was, and the nobility of him, like he almost seems like angelic, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I think Actually, it's, his face to me does look like a like some of the Greek, um, like uh, sculptures I've seen of faces. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Is that am I wrong on that? No. No, definitely spot on. Yeah. yeah. Yep. All right. And, and that's a bird, right? Does a bird say yeah. what they think? I don't know. I I don't know. It's a good question. Okay. All right. So. The next one we're going to see is by Lazardo Bardi. Yeah, I've I have less affection for this one. It feels like a parlor painting. Mm. Like men would smoke cigars and drink brandy in front of and Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say i'm glad um that is jamie that's that's um putting up the, the naked picture rather than me i think yeah. I, I really did find the most discreet one possible so you know I, I that there I, were really not very many no i i, I, I get more pushback than jamie yeah <laughs> yeah so i i think in this case his hands the hands is what really captures my attention. And he's, he's really trying to shield his, his face and, and push away and yep, she's going for the cloak. Like she's embarrassed. So yeah. I, I just like one of the weird things, like, so there are Renaissance like stock images, like I was talking about mm -hmm. when, you, when you shield yourself. So if I throw a bowl at you, you go, you go like that where the wool is coming from. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but he's shielding himself from something to the left of him, which makes me think, what, what is he shielding? Like, he should be going like that to her, right? Yeah. I I don't know. I, I find it's, it to be like, it's it's a painting of a chick, like, kind of, to me. <laughs> like, okay. You know what I mean? Like, it has, like, yeah. so much. And I, I don't get, care I guess for her expression in... too much either because it looks a little bit too... Uh, passive yeah yeah and the whereas the other one was i mean to me it was powerful it was like no like i sh i will not i cannot like how how could i sin against my god like this way whereas that one feels like yeah. i don't know a little yeah. not not that i have a lot of experience in this but she looks a little bit inebriated <laughs> she did yeah okay all right so that was lazaro baldi and that was oil i want to get to this where it says there's 12 manifestations of dying and rising in joseph's life through these passages chapters 37 through 50 and i literally was just going through the scriptures and counting them so you know maybe someone else could find another one or argue that one of these might be the same but here's what i put down is that joseph rises because he's given a new coat of many colors but then his dying he's mocked by his family members he rises because he's, his dreams are showing that, you know, God's going to put him on the top and everything's going to bow down to him. But then he's dying because his brothers are trying to kill him and send him into this death of a deep well because of it. He's rising because his brothers say, hey, let, let's give him a chance, you know, to make some money off of him, sell him to the Ishmaelites. So Joseph rises. He has another chance to live. Now he's dying. Joseph's sold into slavery. But then he's rising because Joseph becomes trusted servant to Potiphar's household. But then he passes a test with Potiphar's wife and goes back in the depths of the jail, loses everything, and is a prisoner um, left for dead. So he's dying again. Now he's rising because Joseph is cleaned up with new clothes to interpret Potiphar's dream. God's resurrected him again. And he's given a place of honor, saving Egypt from future famine. So there's another rising in that. But then he's dying again. So Joseph learns that his family is about to starve without food. And then rising again when Joseph tests his brother's character and his family is restored, reunited, and forgiven. So that is a really dramatic life with a lot of rising and dying. And 
sort of begs this question of how do we respond in trials? And we have choices that we can make. Do we blame God for our trials or do we blame ourselves or others? Or do we believe there's no God or doubt that God cares or hears us? Or do we look for the bigger picture for what God is doing that we don't immediately understand? And do we trust in God's timing to reveal that bigger picture? Because that's what takes faith. Joseph rises again, and he's given a place of honor for interpreting Potiphar's dream. Um, that doesn't happen immediately. He's in prison for two years, and now he's 30 years old, and he's put in charge of everything second to Pharaoh. And he, he is able to supply enough grain for the seven-year famine that comes up. And we're two years into that seven-year famine, and the unsuspecting brothers show up. So Joseph puts his brothers to the test and it says in the scripture, this is how I will know whether you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food to your starving household and go and bring your youngest brother back. So I know you're not spies. And then, you know, of course he puts something in their sack and they're like, oh no, we're in big, big trouble. And they beg Jacob to let Benjamin go. But Jacob says, my son, if he, you know, my son's already dead. If this, my youngest, his brother becomes dead, like Joseph. And if any harm comes to him, you're going to bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. So they are in a tight situation because they're starving and they do have to go back with Benjamin. And Jacob finally says, okay, but I'm going to die in sorrow if he doesn't come back to me. So I think one of the questions that I've always had about this story is why is Joseph testing his brothers so much? Like, wouldn't one test be enough? Well, his brothers have a history of lying and scheming and putting themselves first. So he wants proof that his youngest brother, Benjamin, really, in fact, is alive and well. And Joseph wants to know if they've hurt him and needs proof of that. And the silver in the sack will make sure that they come back with Benjamin and to see, are they going to take that money and steal it? Are they going to bring it back? Um, they probably wouldn't have come back except that they were running out of food and they're trying to bring extra gifts because they're so afraid of, you know, Pharaoh's wrath. So they don't have a lot like balm, honey, spices, myrrh, pistachio nuts, almonds. It's like the writer is trying to, you know, oh, we can give them this. We can give them that, you know, we can double up the amount that was taken, you know, double the, up the silver, you know, but they're, you know, it's, it's not a lot for somebody like Pharaoh, who's a king. Joseph tests if their brothers will be upset and angry that the youngest is given double portions of the food at the feast that he invites when they all trek back with Benjamin. So um, that's an interesting story that we're going to get to next. So we're going to see that in artwork, but Joseph says come and um come to my palace and they are terrified they're thinking they're going to be tricked and attacked at his palace um when joseph does put the silver cup in benjamin's sack um, he sends a steward to go catch up and accuse him of stealing with penalty that whoever's has his silver cup is going to have to be joseph's slave and of course, it's Benjamin, right? And so he wants to know, are the brothers going to just ditch Benjamin to save their own lives? Or are they going to stand by their youngest brother? And have they changed? And then at that feast that he gives to the brothers, Joseph gives five times the portion of food to Benjamin. And then he's watching really closely to see, are those brothers going to react the same way they did when Joseph was getting special attention? Are they going to be jealous and upset? So he's watching and testing. We're going to go ahead and take a look at our modern artist from Israel, Yoram Rannan again, in this artwork, Joseph enjoying a feast with his brothers. So it says, they served him by himself and the brothers by themselves because the Egyptians who ate with them um, could not eat with the Hebrews um, because it was detestable to the Egyptians. And the men had been seated before him in order of their age, and they were looking at each other in astonishment. And when portions were served to Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. And so they feasted and drank freely with him. And about this painting that we're going to see, 
At this lavish meal, Joseph, the grand vizier of Egypt, invites his brothers to dine with him, his true identity unbeknownst to them. The cool greens and blues contrast the warm, glowing sunlight, and there's a feeling of anticipation. Joseph sits elevated at his own table, surrounded by his entourage. On the other side of the grand banquet hall, his brothers sit together. Yehuda, the brother destined for kingship, is seated, his face glowing. The Egyptians would not dine with the Hebrews, and so they're relegated in the background. And painted with much attention to detail, a lot is left to the imagination. And you can tell by the colors and um, just everything that there's an atmosphere of intoxication in this painting. So let's take a look at that. Joseph enjoying a feast with his brothers. I have to say, the first thing I think about when I look at this is Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually thought the same. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> at least I'm not going crazy. Hmm. Yeah, it looks like nightlife in a city. Yeah, yeah. And these country bumpkins are here and they, you know, they don't know what's going on. And now all of a sudden they're seated in order and things are, you know, there's food on the table. They're probably, you know, happy to have anything and they're going along with it and they're not quite figuring out what's going on. Um, it, it feels hot to me, the colors, and that increases the intensity of the painting to me. Okay. All right. And so the question is, is will Joseph's brothers face their trials with integrity? And they come before Joseph and Joseph uses his Egyptian culture to say that, how could you have stolen this, you know, silver in the sacks? Don't you know that I can know things by divination. So why would you even try stealing? So this is very cunning and uh, clever. And Joseph only says, I'll just keep Benjamin as my slave. You guys can go home. And this is like the final test. And his brothers, they just break down at this point. And they're like, no, no, no. Our father's heart would fail and die if we do that. We cannot do that. And so Joseph realizes they've passed the test. They're not leaving their brother as a slave, they're not gonna go home without him. They care about their father enough and they're showing a little humility. Um, Joseph at this point is about ready to weep. And so he tells everyone except to leave his presence except his brothers and he weeps loudly in front of them, in front of them and reveals his identity. And Joseph tells them, it is God who sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there's going to be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. It was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Like, wow, what a revelation to their brothers, to his brothers. This next painting is by Peter von Cornelius and Joseph revealing himself to his brothers. All right. And Cornelius was in the Nazarene Brotherhood. And this is a fresco painting. And this is a really interesting one. The wall painting is almost 10 by nine feet. They painted it on a private wall belonging to Jacob Solomon Barth Bartholdi. And it was not um, popular to to draw religious artwork at this time. And so they kind of just, you know, didn't have a place to do it unless somebody was going to give them space. And Cornelius himself said of this work that you're going to see, this work makes me the happiest of all people. Even if I only had one crust of bread left, I would not change it. In my breast beats a sure prophetic feeling that art will break through from here to a new beautiful existence. 
This painting was also endangered from 1825 onward, so they detached the masonry behind it and reattached it to a wooden framework to move it from Rome to Berlin in the National Gallery. Let's go look at that one. Yeah, this is such an amazing painting. The color seems so balanced to me. Yeah, very natural. I mean, just even the responses of, you know, some of the brothers are almost like resentful that they've been truly found out and the, the gig is up and others like, I don't know if it's Reuben, but like, you know, Reuben having been the least bad out of all of them, just some kissing his hand and the tenderness of his face. Like Joseph's face is, is so tender. It's actually, um, sometimes like artists, and this is, this was not in, um, this had nothing to do with anything in terms of sexuality or gender, but when they was the highest level of purity, they were angelic. And so there is semi androgynous where it's like, and his face is so beautiful. It almost has like a Botticelli transcendence to it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it's like, it's really pure. It's, it's just incredibly beautiful. Um, just to see like little Benjamin. I just think this is a wonderful painting the, the head on the shoulder. The one brother just like, oh, like, what have we done? And like overwhelmed, like, it's a beautiful piece. Really, really beautiful. And the, even the servant looking on, you know what I mean? Um, if, if that is the servant, I don't know. I haven't counted the heads. It's a tremendous piece. It's, it's sad to me that Benjamin never reached adulthood. <laughs> He may have been close to 20, I think. Always the little brother. But always, yes, right? You're always, I don't know. He looks like he's the youngest, he, always the youngest. He looks like he's eight there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, and then there's this dreamy quality to the background, the backdrop. Yeah. No, I just just for me i like the technical uh of the tech technical expertise of the marble on the ground i think that's it's kind of a throwaway part but but i think it's, it's so well done and what's interesting is uh the perspective lines in the piece they all point to the angry brother with the beard um so look at the, all the lines of the marble they all go to his left eye our, our left eye his right eye um wow which is unlikely. You'd think all the perspective, you know, single point perspective usually points to like, you know, Joseph and Benjamin's face, but they don't, they go to that angry brother's face. Mm. So maybe it's almost like hinting at the dark, the dark future that Israel would have splitting, you know, from Judah and lost tribes and things of that sort. Um, maybe the painting has a prophetic element as well. It's, Tremendous. There's a lot of psychology. It's like Shakespearean in its like complexity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we are out of time and we are concluding. So Concluding thoughts on Joseph's life. I put a few down. I'm sure you have some as well. If you want to stay and share those, you may. On this level, with so many different levels here of resurrection, we see that Joseph came from a troubled family and carried out God's promise. And I think that speaks so strongly that your past doesn't define you, but God does. Joseph did the right thing and it still got him in trouble. So I think that speaks that doing the right thing can be hard and unrewarding in the short term, but God will still find a way to bless you for it. Personal integrity, we find in this story, is possible in high leadership positions while living in a pagan, corrupt culture. And this really went contrary to the Jewish idolatry, idol, ideology that withdrawing from society was the right way to be righteous. 
Lot also defies that norm when he lives at the gates of the most wicked city on earth and yet is seen by God as righteous. And I think we learn in this story, in this account of Joseph, that when we accept Jesus's work on the cross, we're replacing our stained garments for garments of righteousness. And this theme of resurrection with garments is just amazing to me. And I want to leave us with this verse in Isaiah 61.10. He has wrapped me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. And there's a lot of beauty in that statement. Hey, thank you. This was amazing. I'm uh, I have to warn people that I'm not going to do quite as thorough a job next week. <laughs> so me and Kevin are kind of on for next week, and he already doesn't like one of my paintings, so it's going to be an interesting evening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so next week we're we're looking at Daniel in the lion's den. Um, Cool, from one pit to the next. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it, so it should be interesting. Let me uh, close us in prayer, and then um, we'll thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you hopefully next week. Um, if you did like it, you can certainly share this um, on, you know, to your friends um, with the, through the live stream. Anyway, let me pray for us. Jesus, thanks for tonight, and Jamie's um, excellent. Uh, talk and and the different paintings uh, it's so amazing lord how you um gift people with this this gift of of artwork and being able to see something that isn't there and and communicate it to us so lord we we thank you for this time together in your word and ask that you would continue to be with us as we work our way towards easter sunday I ask your blessing on everyone that's 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 here. Um, that you would always use our lives to f f for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. All right. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Kevin. You yeah, Jamie, awesome. that was wonderful. Quick question, Jamie. Um, you had the death, resurrection, or um, am, am I saying it correct? You yes, had yes. all. Um, was that the list that you came up with? That was my list. It was tremendous. I screenshotted it as you shared awesome. it. it was, Thank you. I, I appreciate I've never that. Seen it broken down that way, and <laughs> I could say of my own life, and everyone probably on this call could say the same that that's that that is life. And I was looking at it. I was like, wow. Like I've I've just never seen it so clearly laid out. It was wonderful. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think it gives us a lot of hope that when we're going through dark times, that God's going to bring us up again. Yeah, totally. I, right. I needed I needed that. Thank you. Awesome. Take care. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night.